And apart from the example in the RAF training scheme now, this 32 squadron march. As the Sea Hurricane comes into the overhead for a short practice display, the Bristol Mercury engine of the collection's Gloucester Gladiator starting up. That's shortly to go for an air test and also, I believe, a practice display on its return. in the form of the Morang Saunier uh, entering the circuit. Beautiful shape with that aircraft. And you have to remember this was almost the, the French military equivalent of the Tiger Moth. Uh, it was their ab initio trainer for uh, almost three decades. Uh, wonderful Samsung uh, radial engine on the, the front of the aircraft. It's a lovely aeroplane to, to fly as well because you've got almost perfect visibility downwards. Uh, you can't see a heck of a lot forwards, all you can see are uh, three or four engine cylinders in your line of vision, but uh, it's, only uh, one it's, of it's, the interwar parasol winged Morin Saunier aeroplanes currently flying in the UK, much beloved on the French vintage aircraft scene. A lot of them were used as glider tugs after World War II, and today these aircraft are mainstays of many a historic display in France. Indeed, this one was owned for a time by Jacques Crean, the former solo leader of the Papouille de France aerobatic team, still displaying to this day, indeed still displaying these aircraft um, to this day on occasion, and the possessor of aviation's finest moustache. Once again, uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Flying AV Air Show and uh, appropriate timing as arriving in the circuit to head in and land on as a static exhibit is the Augusta Westland Leonardo uh, AW159 Wildcat. This is one of the latest types to be operated uh, by the UK military and by the Royal Navy. The Wildcat is a new state-of-the-art version of the former Westland Superlinks military helicopter. 
and has now been replacing the long-serving Lynx Mark 7, 8 and 9, both in uh, RAF, uh, British Army and Royal Navy service. as the Seafire Mark III now joins through the overhead and we'll be watching that aeroplane progress its way around the circuit as we also... Having been sold on, having mentioned France's aeronautique navale in the context of the Moir Saunier MS317 that we saw arriving earlier, this Seafire indeed saw service in its latter operational years with the French aeronavale and indeed was privately owned in France, albeit not airworthy, for some time Thereafter. Another interesting arrival uh, there, which, uh, although it's not a display participant, well worth a little look. See the Haps biplane, little uh, single seat uh, biplane designed by, if I remember rightly, Charles Haps in the, the USA in the 1940s. Uh, basically, a modified set of Piper Cub wings, making a very nice little sporting single seat biplane. We'll talk about in more detail in the future, or another aircraft, shall I say, in, the, in that it doesn't have its wings bolted on, which is the west which allows it to be uh, relatively easily moved on the uh, very small landing deck on the back end of the frigate. Well, we'll try it off, and uh, I'm not quite sure if it's going to run any more, or whether we'll do the fact that it's going to be played at the uh, uh, we'll keep an eye on that and uh, watch the aeroplane's progress in the overall security. Meanwhile, uh, just as a heads up, uh, uh, reflecting Richard Ullman's chapel that's live. Meanwhile, let's enjoy the sight and sound of the
Johnston will be following. Then we have the large Wolsey Tourer, 24 horsepower again. It's a very impressive full body touring car, complete with luggage on the top. And the uh, second Model T, Chris Cheeseman's own machine. He's got not only the Model T, he also has a remarkably beautiful Model A Ford, which he occasionally brings along. Plus the Ford Model Y, which you may remember from the late 30s, many of which were still running into the 50s, of course. We then have the Wellingborough bus, which I would have grabbed a bit more info on if I'd known it was coming. The uh, flat twin Jowett with Bull Brooks up. lovely little Fiat Topolino. The Topolino is actually very well worth a closer look because for its time it was a remarkably advanced car. It has a beautiful tiny 600cc four-cylinder engine, all aluminium, right down at the front with the radiator behind it, and hydraulic brakes among other things. So very advanced for the 1930s. Next car through is the Bean, Neil Thomas driving. This is another one of Stewart's cars. The Bean was actually an attempt to compete with Ford after the First World War. A large factory was set up in Birmingham, but uh, unfortunately things didn't quite go according to plan. The car turned out to be a lot more expensive to make than it was a first thought. But uh, as you can see, it's quite an impressive car. Next one, of course, is the Austin 7 Tourer. Now, the MGTA just behind it was Richard Shuttleworth's personal car uh, up until the time of his untimely death. The TA was the very first of this line of MGs, followed by the TB, TC, TD and TF. For some reason there was no TE that I know of. But uh, they had problems with the engine on the early model. In fact, the TB was um, the replacement vehicle, but uh, unfortunately was caught short by the start of the Second World War. So most people would not remember it. And the next one along that was built in any quantity was the TC. We then have two Hillmans. One in Royal Air Force bomb disposal colours, and the second one is actually in Royal Marines livery. Um, it's not one I know a great deal about. I do know that it does have an all synchromesh gearbox, because I was lucky enough to read a blurb just before I came down here. We then have the Austin Burnham, and the car behind it is a Railton. It has a four and a quarter litre straight eight Hudson engine made in America. Uh, many companies in this country at that time were using American engines for their size and their power and reliability. Uh, Dorothy Shuttleworth, in fact, used to be chauffeured into London when she was doing war work during the Second World War in that car. And um, by all accounts, it didn't take very long. The performance, well, the top speed I've gathered, I've seen to remember, is described as in excess of 90 miles per hour. How far in excess? Well. Who knows, but uh, as you can see, it's a very impressive vehicle and uh, it's been very lovingly looked after over many years by the volunteers in the collection. As I was saying, the military vehicles, really, I wasn't expecting, but people like to throw me curveballs now and again, so we have a very nice little uh, scout car in the parade, followed by our own wireless truck and then the Dodge Ambulance and the Wolseley Hornet which I must admit I'd love to have a go in the way we've got a uh, Bringing up the rear, of course, the uh, Ferguson Ford aircraft carrier tractor. I think the lads are going to make one more run. They normally do. Very interesting little bits and pieces actually about many of these vehicles. Jowett's, of course. Um, <laughs> for Walker C. Hurricane 1B.
Wonderful phone display and that sound of the 24 litre Rolls Royce Merlin engine in this form developing just on a thousand horsepower. Uh, by the end of the war, same engine was probably delivering 70% more than that due to high octane fuels and additional supercharging. Sea Hurricanes of the Fleet Air Arm were involved in many important engagements of World War II. The first kill of an FW200 Condor was undertaken by one of the early Hurricats in June 41. A year later, Operation Pedestal, a mission to support a supply convoy resupplying the island of Malta, involved three Sea Hurricane squadrons with 46 aircraft, divided between three carriers. The carrier fighter force engaged in Pedestal further included Grumman Martlets, and fairy pool Mars, 12 of 16 Sea Hurricanes flown off HMS Eagle were lost when the carrier was torpedoed by a German U-boat. But the remainder assisted in the convoy's successful passage and Operation Pedestal was an important contributor to the Allied holding of Malta. and the Sea Hurricane in this form featured at Armament 8 Browning 303, 0.303 inch machine guns. Basically the Browning machine gun was an American machine gun design adapted to take the standard British ammunition uh, with slightly low on calibre. Some of the later Hurricanes had up to 12 cannon in the wing, uh, machine guns in the wing. And if you look closely at the wing leading edge, you'll actually see strips of canvas that actually go across the front of the gun barrels to keep the aircraft clean. The idea being that if you fired the guns, it would then, the first shell would blast through the canvas to lose a tiny bit of performance. Out in the background.
fascinating to see both of these aircraft that uh, really have a connection with the Falklands conflict. Uh, one WASP uh, launched uh, from HMS Plymouth and two WASPs from HMS Endure. but 11 WASPs went on to serve in the South Atlantic Theatre. And not only did they fly from frigates, but also the ice patrol ship HMS Endurance, from a container ship and survey ships. And interestingly too, this uh, Bell UH-1 Huey uh, is also a Falklands veteran. It owes its presence in the UK to a gentleman called Squadron Leader Rob Tierney who, while serving in the Falklands, borrowed it from the other side and then managed to find a way of getting it home. Uh, after the surrender of the Argentine forces in June 82, uh, Rob Tierney borrowed this helicopter from a sports field outside Port Stanley and used it to ship freight and troops around the Falklands. The UK, and it's now been operated by the G. Huey Partnership since 2012. solo display that uh, journey back from the Falklands to Britain that Steve was just mentioning wasn't without incident. It came back on the chartered ferry to Port Caledonia and then had to make a road through to Aria Fillingley near Doncaster but unfortunately the whole route is suffered from quite bad damage when a rotor blade hit a road bridge. It was a three and a half year restoration required to get it back into flying condition by Rob Tierney and those who helped him. I went through again at RAF Odium in Hector in May 1986. Appropriately enough, one of those who was watching was the former governor of the Falkland Islands and former RAF Spitfire pilot, Sir Rex Hunt. because it was originally designated the HU-1B and even after they then made it a UH-1B the name stuck and uh, in fact so iconic was the name that by the late 1960s they even had it engraved on the rudder pen. Remarkably versatile in Vietnam the Huey they could perform almost all aspects of a rotary wing assault mission both bring the troops in, protecting them with their own weaponry, then extracting them and extracting the casualties. And the UH-1 is still very much in military service in many geysers around the world. In Europe, they can be found still in use with the air arms of Germany and Spain. And the twin-engine UH-1Y variant is still in production for the United States Marine Corps. And as Ben was saying, more than 16,000 new units have now been built in 70, in 7 different countries. They have a quick 70 different armed forces around the world, and there's a calculation that the Huey fleet has now passed 12 million flying hours. Most associated in terms of its active service with the US Army, the UH-1, and the last U.S. Army Huey were only retired last November by the Redstone Test Center in Alabama. But various U.S. law enforcement agencies 
Still fly them. This remains a machine very much relevant to modern day use, even some 61 years after its first flight. designed to be compact enough to fit onto the very small deck, a very small hangar of Her Majesty's frigates. And that led to that very unusual four-wheel castering undercarriage, which basically has each wheel pointing in a different direction. The idea for that was to allow the was to pin itself down on a cooking deck and then put the maneuver into the hangar. The other thing was the was is pretty rare in having negative kick on its rotors, which literally forces the helicopter down onto the deck, so it's an adhere to a fiction in slippery deck to until the lashings are attacked. altitude here and uh, not one but two of these pre-war gliders that were pressed into service for radar files for the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force and in this quite dusting conditions to do a dual tow like that really really that no in from the right the right sander an aeroplane of unusual appearance, but it's actually very aerodynamically advanced. It was equipped with fully automatic wing slots, slotted flaps, and the variable incidence tailplane, and they gave the aircraft a stalling speed of just 65 miles an hour. is actually carrying the markings and the configuration of a special duties Lysander used to drop and recover agents and uh, down pilots from occupied France. Uh, it also commemorates today the role of 18 Lysanders flown by the fleet air arm as target tugs for the gunners of the Royal Navy and it would tow a banner target to allow them live gunnery practice. particular Lysander was actually built as a target tug, uh, operated in Canada by the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, Post-World War II, sold to a Canadian collector, then in 1971, crossed the Atlantic to the Strathallan Collection in Scotland, where it was restored to flying condition in 1979.
all of the fleet air arms Lysanders were transferred from the Royal Air Force. It wasn't just to the Navy that they went once the RAF had deemed them obsolete because a number also went to the United States 8th Air Force based in the UK, also as target tugs in which role they were joined by the likes of P-47 Thunderbolts and Volte A-35s. Well, I was actually very lucky back in the 1970s. I was lucky in the 1970s to fly with a gentleman by the name of John Gladish, who uh, had actually learned to fly at the very end of the Great War on Avro 504s with the Royal Naval Air Service. Uh, he was then in his uh, 70s, or late 70s, and uh, he told me once that uh, during the Second World War he'd applied to rejoin the Fleet Air Arm and was turned down because he was too old for operational service. He was subsequently posted onto the Lysander target tug. A role which he said was far more dangerous than if he'd gone into combat flying. For those of you who saw it will well remember rather more extreme short takeoff and landing uh, capabilities. But Lysander, no slouch in that regard. As indeed we see demonstrated here over the fence into a field rather larger than those into which these aircraft would have operated in occupied France from 1941 to 44. Paul Stone with the Western Lysander 3A. And as the Lysander, there were a lot of accidents on aircraft carriers as the aircraft uh, near the ground out, the F edge of the flight deck on their approach to land on. So to investigate this phenomenon, uh, Commander John Spruill, a former designer at uh, Slingsby's, uh, was given a research program to try and establish the airflow patterns over the rear end of large aircraft carriers. And the way he did it was to launch a glider on a winch behind the aircraft carrier, allowing yes, the, uh, the aircraft that was used in the trials And how about giving Paul Stone a wave and a round of applause? Lovely display in the Lysander. And earlier on today, those who perhaps saw Paul Stone's practice display saw him make a little bit of history by dedicating the new runway on the far right of the flight line, the, uh, the Meadow Runway as it's been called, uh, with the first landing uh, by an aircraft uh, on that new runway here. Now, wingtip to wingtip come the two Slingsby kites. Uh, these kites are pre-war Slingsby gliders. They were designed and developed from the German Grunau Baby, one of the most built gliders anywhere in the world, uh, by Slingsby. Fred Slingsby was an aircraft builder at Kirby Moorside in North Yorkshire, uh, particularly flew from the second bank airfield up there, and he developed the Grunau Baby design with a longer gold wing and rounded fuselage formers, which gave it this very distinctive appearance. And these gliders were used in the war years uh, for, to try and identify whether a glider could be picked up by radar. And the camouflage glider you'll see here is an absolute one-off. They were towed by Avro 504s, and in fact the Shuttleworth 504 was one of the aircraft used for these trials. And the camouflage one you'll see there had every single component made out of a non-metallic material where possible including the control push rods which were made out of wood and even the rudder cables were made out of cat gut and guess what it still showed up on the radar yes there were some quite extensive radar trials of various types undertaken with machines such as these in 1940 there were efforts to calibrate the new chain home and chain home low air defense radars that were so vital to the successful conduct of the battle of britain and so Kirby kites were used for that, and then the later work that Steve was describing, for which a great fleet of gliders was assembled under the auspices of the Air Fighting Development Unit, then stationed at RAF Duxford. And quite apart from the so-called radar kite that we see here, one of the others was a Scott Viking, which also survives to this day.
Indeed, in fact, there's a lovely story told by Philip Wills, who went on to Britain's first gliding world champion. It became almost like for three months an unofficial gliding club in the middle of the Battle of Britain. And he was actually being towed out over the channel by the shuttle with Avro 504. Um, and he said, three Messerschmitt 109s passed them going in the opposite direction. He said, I think they were heading for a stiff drink, having seen a First World War biplane towing a glider towards France. <laughs> they used to operate from a uh, field near the very secret site at Worth Matravers in Dorset. Uh, but on one occasion, one of the Tiger Moths that was also used as a uh, tug aircraft uh, or it might have been one of the 504s, actually, that Steve just mentioned. I can't quite recall. But anyway, it still had the tow rope attached when it decided to land at RAF Tangmere and uh, unfortunately clipped an electricity cable and took out all of the base's electricity. We're watching these two beautiful and graceful Slingsby kites literally in silence. Um, lovely sight to, to behold. Interestingly, John Sproul, who was the man behind the death landing trials, went on to become the officer commanding HMS Daedalus at uh, Leon Solent. And he built up a fleet of refurbished gliders just after the war there to start the Royal Naval Gliding Club. And uh, he actually repatriated bits of various Grunau gliders and others, Vihers and others, uh, on the decks of destroyers and then reassembled them there. And they were reassembled by a wonderful gentleman known as Pop Pininger. And Pop Pininger actually served his time at Hendon before the Great War working on Codron aircraft. And he was pressed into service to get some of these gliders airworthy. And now we're seeing, I think, the two gliders heading into wind. Uh, we're just seeing there the spoilers just popping in and out. And uh, beautiful into wind landings by two absolutely lovely gliders. British Admiral George Anson reflecting its initial role as a maritime reconnaissance aircraft and the Avro Anson went on to be a mainstay of that work. Ten squadrons of Ansons were used by RAF Coastal Command on coastal patrols and air sea rescue work later in the war. Um, one even scored a probable hit on a German U-boat. And in 1940 as well, a flight of three Ansons was attacked by nine Luftwaffe Messerschmitt 109s. It's got to be said they had to be rookies, because by the time the dogfight ended, without losing any of their own, by flying in tight circles, one of the Anson crews claimed they'd scored two German aircraft and damaged a third. Anson was the first plane with a retractable undercarriage to enter RAF service. It was pretty soon obsolete on the front line when aircraft like the Lockheed Hudson and Armstrong Whitworth Whitley arrived. But during wartime it really earned its spurs as a trainer for all members of bomber crews in which role it served both at home and in Canada. In the latter case with the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, just under 7,000 examples of the Anson on alone ended up being produced purposes. A fleet air arm telegraphist air gunner training unit was one of the recipients. The Navy used some for communications purposes. It estimated that some 200 or so Mark I and II Ansons were used by the fleet air arm. This particular aircraft is one of the post-war civilian Ansons. In fact they were still in production up to 1952. Uh, this aircraft made its first flight in November 1946 and was used as a communications aircraft and also as a development aircraft for instruments by Smith's Instruments at Staverton at Gloucester. And they operated it till 1959.
The aircraft then had holes cut in the floor and it was used on aerial survey contracts, first of all by Meridian Air Maps and then Kemp's Aerial Surveys, uh, who operated it until the early 1970s. Now, I've got to say, I declare an interest in a sister aeroplane of this one because when they ferried the entire fleet of five aircraft um, up to uh, Strathallan in Scotland, as a snotty teenager, I managed to blag a ride on um, Golf Alpha Hotel India Charlie uh, on the way up there. And I've got to say, that's probably one of the reasons why I've still got an addiction to old aeroplanes and things like Avro Ansons. Uh, to this day. Uh, uh, and our Balbo finale involving Wildcat, Bearcat, Sea Hurricane, Lysander, Gladiator, and Demon. And there is the is the Demon demonstrating the beautiful markings of the 54th Squadron. Well, therefore, it's over the main fighter collection of ducks that, due to wind conditions, elected not to land on here today. And again, you can see those distinctive lines of the classic Cam Hawker. By plane of the 1930s. Stopped on HMS Glorious, and uh, she stayed on board HMS Glorious until she was struck off charge in 1938. And it's thought around that time it was donated to either a Sea Scout or an Air Cadet Squadron. So. Uh, it would have been very interesting. Can you imagine being a group of Sea Scouts and they say, Would you like a Hawker Nimrod? How good would that be? Rather like giving a group of Sea Scouts a Sea Harrier in more recent uh, years. That's unimaginable. The Nimrod did see some active service with the fleet air arm in its day. They were deployed quite widely aboard carriers. One former Nimrod pilot was an RAF pilot, Air Vice Marshal Geoffrey Evely. Among the Nimrods he flew during his active service was the very Mark I that we see here in this formation. And he once recounted the first embarkation of 802 Squadron on HMS Glorious in August 1935. That was after Mussolini's Italy had invaded Abyssinia. Evely said the Navy dashed off to the eastern Mediterranean to look fierce. They spent 11 months of embarkation in Alexandria in Egypt, but they saw no action. The formation then led by the demon with a Nimrod on either wing about to run in from our left. And interestingly, uh, uh, Jeffrey Evely actually flew both the Nimrods that are in this formation. Rye in Kent, who really are, I think, uh, perhaps the, the go-to people for uh, classic Hawker vibrant. is the two-seat fighter variant of the Hawker line and uh, I've now had a mental block and Ben will be of course be able to tell me what the naval two-seat fighter was. I suspect it was the Osprey but uh, these new fighters were actually built from the Harp when it was discovered the Harp was nearly as fast as the single-seat fighters that were supposed to be catching them and uh, the Demon powered by a 600 horsepower Kestrel 5 engine has a single rear-mounted 303 Lewis gun and two fixed machine guns in the nose and this actual aircraft was the 23rd aircraft 
of a batch of 37 uh, taken on charge by the RAF in October 1937, quite close to the outbreak of war. flight of the Royal Naval College at Dartmouth and in fact four Tiger Moths from Dartmouth actually were the last ever biplanes to land on one of Her Majesty's ships. For some aerobatics. First chipmunks came into service in 1966. They were 12x RAF examples that went to the Britannia Royal Naval College Air Experience Flight at Robra near Plymouth. 787, uh, 78, oh, sorry, 771 and 781 squadrons at Coldrone from Leon Solis, Lisbon Communications, and as glider tugs. And Royal Navy Station flights at Coldrone, as Lossiemouth and Yodelton did likewise. The last of them in service were those of Britannia flight at Robra. They weren't retired until 1993, just a few years before the final RAF chipmunks were retired. At least those not belonging to the Battle of Britain Memorial flight, because in the same way as the Royal Navy Historic flight has this one, the BBMF still has two on hand for tail dragger conversion use.
Yes, Miss Chipmunk actually plays a very important role with the Royal Naval Historic Flight, as indeed do the two that are still actually on RAF charge uh, with the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Um, the Chipmunk is used to assess and evaluate uh, on blind pilots, who are obviously of very high quality, who wish to then join uh, the Royal Naval Historic Flight to assimilate whether they are, uh, their skills to if they are appropriate to fly into the aeroplane. Meanwhile, lovely sight of the two central flying school liveried aircraft, the uh, de Havilland 82 Tiger Moth and the Avro Tutor. And uh, the collection's 1931 Tutor was actually used by the central flying school and by the uh, RAF College Cranwell as a uh, training aircraft and then was used for communication. As you mentioned earlier, Ben, the uh, Armstrong Sydney Lynx engine is an in incredibly rare engine. This aircraft was actually grounded um, in the late 1970s uh, because there simply weren't enough bits to make one. I think it took six engines, if I remember rightly, uh, for the uh, engineers at Armstrong Sydney at Coventry to actually be able to assemble a working engine. And if the word hen's teeth came into it earlier on with the Cheetah engine, it is even more so with the Lynx engine in front of the Avro Cheetah. doing with a slippery monoplane to slow it down enough to formate on two rather draggy biplanes. And the grey, white and red livery of the chipmunk there was unique to the aircraft used by the uh, Royal Navy uh, training units. The RAF aircraft initially silver with yellow trainer bands and then in the white and red raspberry ripple uh, paint schemes have slightly different appearance to those you yeah, find the spotter when the float in the carburetor uh, gets taken over by gravity and goes the wrong way. The yeah. aviator was actually used by the Royal Navy and the Fleet Air Arm uh, on a number of different occasions, and we'll tell you a few of those in just a moment. Gladiator was when Italian forces in Ethiopia uh, threatened Aden in 1940 and gladiators of 94 squadron attacked Italian airfields, supply depots and aircraft. Uh, they were also assigned to protecting Allied shipping and it was in that role that a Famous was the Sea Gladiators' role in the defence of Malta. A stock of 18 Sea Gladiators from 802 Naval Air Squadron uh, had been delivered by HMS Glorious in early 1940. Some of these were shipped out to take part in the Norwegian campaign. Some of the others uh, were shipped to Egypt. By April 1940, Malta was in urgent need of fighter protection, so it was decided to form a flight of gladiators at RAF Hull Far, composed of RAF and Fleet Air Arm personnel, and the sea gladiators were assembled and became, for ten days, the sole fighter force defending Malta. The legend was, of course, that the three aircraft named Faith, Hope and Charity formed the entire fighter cover for the weekend, but for the duration. A 
actually more than three aircraft were operational in Holborn, not always at the same time. One interesting thing though was a 1435 flight, which was the flight's official number, was also then designated to the three Phantoms, or four Phantoms later, that were looking after the Falkland Islands in 1988. They too were named Faith, Hope and Charity, the fourth one, Desperation. Hello, 1435 flight. Tradition subsequently adopted after the RAF's retirement of the Phantom by Tornado F3s and today by Eurofighter Typhoons. In Malta, the gladiators, the sea gladiators, put up a dogged defence, though inevitably they found themselves more effective against the Fiat CR32 and CR42 biplanes. they were up against from Italy's Air Force, the Regia Aeronautica, than the more modern German and Italian monoplanes in the theatre. Another role with a naval connection was performed during the Battle of Britain by number 247 Squadron, part of RAF Fighter Command. It was formed at the height of the battle on the 1st of August 1940 at Robra in Plymouth to defend not just that part of the UK but especially the vital naval dockyards in Plymouth. But they had no success either by day or the Luftwaffe changed its, ta its tactics by night. Well, I think once again we're, as we did with the air test earlier, going to see the Gladiator using the uh, recently sewed Meadow Strip. <laughs> there we go. That aircraft in the markings of number 73 Squadron, Royal Air Force, as well as the Gladiator. Here comes the Harvard. A dark painted aircraft against a dark sky, alas. This is the AT-6D model of Kennet Aviation, which now lives here at Old. in all respects a very significant aircraft, the T6 Texan or Harvard. Because quite apart from the number of Allied that it trained both before, during and after World War II, it also made the name of its manufacturer, North American Aviation. Indeed, North American success in producing Harvards in excess of the planned production schedule led to direct congratulations by telegram from the then Minister of Aircraft Production, Lord Beaverbrook, to the North American Aviation President, Dutch Kindleberger. And that was among the reasons why, when late in 1940, North American came up with the NA-73, which became the P-51 Mustang, after the Great War. The aircraft you're seeing just getting airborne now, the blue and white aircraft, is the earliest flying de Havilland moth in the world. And both these yeah. aircraft, the LG, was the eighth moth built and in 1925 was flown by Alan Cobham and delivered to the Lancashire Aero Club at Woodford in Cheshire. Uh, it was damaged at Castle Bromwich in 1939, which probably ironically led to its survival because it was stored through World War II 
and then was restored to airworthiness in the early 1950s by the apprentices at the de Havilland Technical School at Pantanger in Hertfordshire, uh, from when it was then flown to Hartfield and into the care of British Aerospace. Uh, it's owned by British Aerospace Systems still, but now a permanent part of the collection's de Havilland exhibits. And the two DH-60 moths now are running in. Both of these aircraft are powered by side down and the sonars hang below the crankshaft giving a higher propeller line and of course the original moths with the gypsy engine in were the gypsy moths neither of these is the leader for formation is a cirrus moth and the one behind is a hermes moth and i'll tell you about that in just a second GEBWD was built in 1928 and initially used by the Brooklyn School of Flying. And Richard Shuttleworth, the founder of this collection, learned to fly in that aircraft. And having learned to fly in it, he bought it in 1932. It originally had the 65 horsepower Cirrus engine, which is what's in the blue and silver moth. And it, he had it uprated with the then state-of-the-art engine, 105 horsepower Cirrus Hermes hence it's known as the Hermes Moth. And this aircraft, the second in the formation, has been based here at Old Warden since 1933, and it holds the record for any aircraft in the world based continuously at one aerodrome. single-seat scout aircraft. Initially it wasn't even armed, it was just used for fast spotting duties. So the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps both embraced the Bristol Scout with huge enthusiasm. They liked its manoeuvrability. Unlike the softwoods which initially were depended on wing warping, this aircraft introduced four ailerons. You also notice the markings are a bit unusual. At the beginning of the war there were no national markings, such so as fired at anything in the air. The Germans operated, uh, adopted their cross. The British had a Union flag, which everybody shot at because they still thought it was a German cross. And the French adopted the cacard, or cacade, better known to us as the roundel. And we adopted it too. In fact, the Royal Naval Air Service initially painted their aircraft in the same way as the French, with the red on the outside, then the white, then the blue. It was only later that the Royal Flying Corps adopted the roundel in the opposite form with the blue on the outside. In its day, this was a rapid and agile machine, the Bristol Scout. Bunny Bremner, grandfather of David and Rick, who along with Theo Wilford. This was very much at the 
born of air-to-air -air combat on one occasion Bunny Bremner went into combat with a Fokker E3 an Eindecker monoplane he got onto its tail and his record said he emptied a drum of ammunition at him but he didn't observe any of it hitting the Eindecker what he didn't say was how many holes he had in his own propeller because number two wing of the RNAS while in service in the eastern Mediterranean tried fitting an unsynchronized Lewis gun to the fuselage side firing through the propeller but this was before the development of suitable interrupter gear so you just had to take it on the chin and about 10% of the bullets would hit your own prop by this very Bristol F2B because in September 1922 HMS Ark Royal which was then a seaplane carrier as opposed to an aircraft carrier transported 12 semi-dismantled F2Bs from number 4 squadron Royal Air Force to the Dardanelles Strait of northwestern Turkey for use in the crisis that erupted there after Turkish forces had threatened British and French troops in the demilitarized zone of the former Ottoman Empire that Ark Royal had no flight deck, so they were transferred by crane to the aircraft carrier HMS Argus. They were put back together. Uh, because the first in the line of Sopwith's, then Hawker's, uh, single-seat fighter, entered service in 1916, first with the Royal Naval Air Service, before the Royal Flying Corps realising the benefits of the aeroplane and its lightness and agility followed suit. The Naval Air Service also used it for pioneering sea trials and in 1917 one made the first ever landing on a ship at sea. And this aircraft actually colours, carries the colours of a shipborne pup which saved on, served on HMS Manxman. In fact the pup that uh, wears the markings that we now see would in period have carried Le Prieur rockets in order to combat zeppelins, and in fact this one has... ...in a single-seat Sopwith pup. So another aeroplane with a tremendous history linked here to the shuttle of Tristel Warden. And, well, combined age of these two aircraft, well in excess of 200 years. was the first the so-called Pup with Zoo of aircraft named after creatures. Pup started out as simply being a nickname. <laughs> with service entry in October 1945, but production soon switched to the FB-11 fighter bomber. 650 of them were built, and in the Korean War, they were flown from three Royal Navy carriers and one of the Royal Canadian Navy. most famous exploit in Korea occurred on the 8th of August 1952 when in an engagement with communist flown Mikoyan Mik-15 jet fighters one of the CQ pilots, Lieutenant Peter Carmichael was credited with downing the machine it was one of the very few of a jet fighter by a piston engine aircraft in history. Later, the early jets indeed came along in the case of the Fleet Air Arm, that meant the Hawker Seahawk. Huntington, Huntington and District uh, Royal Naval Association are here today. 
most of the dedicators sincerely display to their life vice president, the next PTU pilot, Commander Graham Holt, who sadly passed away uh, earlier this week. This one was built in 1953 for the Iraqi Air Force. Later ended up in private hands in the United States. First came to the UK in late 1991, initially for operation by British Airways Concord Captain John Bradshaw. Later on it went to Australia, but last year came back to the UK after acquisition by a new owner, Air Leasing, based at Cywell, built up a deal arranged the aircraft transport and the Well, there was another period where the Sea Fury acquitted itself very well in air combat, and that was during the Bay of Pigs invasion in uh, Cuba. Now, the Cuban Air Force Sea Furies actually wound up uh, fighting off uh, A-26 invader aircraft of the uh, US supported militia. Uh, during the Civil War that uh, brought the Del Castro to Operated by both the Royal Air Force Coastal Command and the uh, US and Canadian Air Forces. Uh, this was an annex of the Australian forces as well in the South Pacific. Uh, this was certainly one of the most versatile aeroplanes uh, of its breed. That huge long wing is basically hollow inside. It's a flying fuel tank which let the aircraft make some immense flights. commercial flights in terms of time aloft still ever made in aviation history were made by Catalinas. Between 1943 and 1945, Qantas Airlines flew weekly between Perth and Colombo in the Indian Ocean, 3,592 nautical miles, and the flights took between 28 and 32 hours in the air. They were known as the double sunrise flights as the, pilot, as the passengers saw two sunrises on every flight. Here we see the wingtip floats extended. And you can also get a good view there of the fuselage side blisters which in the case of this particular example are slightly oversized. Those on service Catalinas would have been rather smaller. Originally the Catalina would have carried three 30 cal machine guns, two in the nose turret and one in a ventral hatch in the tail, and then two 50 caliber machine guns, one in each of those waist blisters. Uh, it also would have carried anything up to 4,000 pounds of bombs or death charges or even torpedoes. But the story I loved best was the Australian Black Cat squadrons which were disrupted Japanese forces in the South Pacific by flying night missions. When they'd exhausted their bomb loads and gunfire, they would fly around at night throwing out beer bottles with razor blades jammed in their necks because the whistle they gave was just the same sound as a falling bomb and would force everybody down to take shelter. 
Now, Catalina with its landing gear down this time, demonstrating its amphibious qualities, and as the raises the landing gear, just keep an eye on how long it takes those wheel mechanisms to lock themselves back into the side of the fuselage. It's an immense piece of mechanical engineering. This one was built in Canada by the Canadian Vickers firm as a PBV-1A Canso, as the Catalina was known in Canada. But today it's in the markings of one of the relatively few OA-10A models that were used by the US Army Air Force in the UK for air sea rescue duties, picking up downed aircrew. Towards the end of the war, the Army Air Force had wanted the type rather earlier than it managed to get them, such was the demand for Catalinas from other services in other theatres. Eventually they got a few to serve with the 5th Emergency Rescue Squadron at Halesworth in Suffolk. Now, uh, yes, the nose wheel has retracted. And very slowly, <laughs> the main wheels do likewise. This aircraft ventures far and wide on the European display circuit. You don't even have to be a pilot. Quite a few of their shareholders, Paul Warren Wilson, the uh, boss of plane sailing, was telling me are not pilots. They're just enthusiasts who enjoy being associated with an historic aeroplane like this and going to some very, very interesting places on it. As for the pilot shareholders, they have a variety of experience. Private pilots, airline pilots, ex-military pilots, the whole gamut. It is, and if you want one of the best seats in the aviation house, take a look at the, what were the gun blisters in the back of this aircraft. Each one of those has a couple of airline seats in it, and you can actually just sit there watching the world go by at a stately 145 knots with 360 degree visibility near enough. Ben, I know you've done it, so I'm very, very envious. Yes, I did, but only for about five minutes from Cambridge to uh, Duxford, and the view we got there was mostly queuing traffic, I think, on the uh, M11. But uh, anyway, the uh, very, very beautiful shape of the TBY 5A out in front of us, and uh, the largely white livery was chosen by plain sailing, not least because it's quite useful for putting sponsors' logos on sometimes. When designs was the one closest to us on uh, that pass, wearing the D-Day invasion stripes of an example flown by our own fleet air arm. Grumman conceived the F-4F as it was known when built by Grumman itself as a biplane, but at the same time one of its main rivals, Brewster, was developing its F-2A as a monoplane. Grumman saw that its offering to the US Navy would be inferior, so it redesigned the F-4F into a monoplane. still needed development to make it absolutely right. Eventually the US Navy liked what it saw and placed a production order. Around the same time a deal was also struck with France, but its aircraft were never delivered. They went instead to Britain's fleet air arm. And indeed it was the fleet air arm that was first to operate the type in anger. We decided to give it our own name initially. We called it the Marklet. And on Christmas Day 1940, the type... The fleet air arm market shot down a Luftwaffe Junkers U88 over Scarpa Flow, and the following year these aircraft became heavily involved in the Battle of the Atlantic. Yes, and the late uh, ironically, former German merchant ship, which was renamed HMS Audacity, uh, he shot down two Luftwaffe Focke-Wulf 200 Condor bombers before his ship was torpedoed by a U-boat. But that was the precursor to a lot of very highly effective convoy escort operations with which the Bartlett or the Wildcat was forever associated. The Wildcat was
was the primary U.S. Navy fighter at the start of the Pacific War, but by the time of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941, only one carrier-based U.S. Navy unit was fully equipped with the type. very tough and it could withstand great battle damage and these aircraft took part in all the major engagements involving American carriers in the latter stage of the war. Yes, and these see them. The sound there, that of the Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp, an 18 cylinder air-cooled radial engine of 2,100 horsepower. And he powered this short, stubby little fighter to a top speed in excess of 420 miles an hour. Japanese fighters were still posing a threat in the Pacific in 1943. Grumman wanted to develop for the US Navy a successor to the hugely successful F-6F Hellcat. It was to be quicker and to be lighter weight, but of course there was a trade-off there. That involved considerably shorter range. It did, but the philosophy of the US Navy pilots of the time, who were fighting in areas such as the Medway, South Pacific, was that the rate of climb was all. And if you watch this aircraft looping now, you can see exactly what was meant by that. This was an aeroplane that was designed to fly fast and climb fast. And its operational rate of climb, complete with load, was something in the region of 4,500 feet a minute. And it topped out with an operational ceiling of 40,000 feet. The pilot was the limiting factor because it hadn't got a pressurized cockpit. It was too late to see operational service in World War II, the Bearcat, but 24 frontline US Navy squadrons flew them. And it was also an early mount of the US Navy demonstration team, the Blue Angels. One problem with that shorter weight, as a few uh, pilots found on various cruisers with the Bearcat, was that it could be a bit tricky to get back aboard ship in the event of, say, bad weather approaching. And there were some notable incidents, shall we say, involving problems such as that. It's not surprising when you see the rate of acceleration of this aircraft towards us now that you can understand why the Bearcat has been a winner in air racing. Um, the a standard Bearcat flown by Mira Slovak won the very first Reno air race back in 1964. And then you've got the ultimate, the Rare Bear as it was known, a very highly modified uh, FHF flown by Lyle Shelton. That dominated Reno for decades and even more so set the world speed record for piston air driven aircraft in 1989 at 528 miles an hour.
going on to that landing. 